and eutrotonics and along with the general measures we have to have parallel management both go on side by side to stop bleeding. So we are continuing with the bimanual uterine compression to stem bleeding and thinking what's to be done next. We've already ruled out a retained placental bit or a traumatic call which could have been seen on examination. And now next comes the role of a temporizing measure to buy time, you try and tampon out. It is, uh, sometimes it may obviate need for definite procedure and it is useful in atonic lower segment with general placenta plus antiplasia. But there is a risk of concealed hemorrhage with certain tamponage measures. The various methods to perform this are use of a condom catheter or a buckley balloon or a packing with gold cause. This is a picture of a buckley balloon catheter inside the uterus. And here is a picture of a condom catheter. Uh, the last is an ultrasound picture with a condom catheter inside, what it looks like. This is what it is tied. And here it is being put in a model. Tamponage maneuvers in a stage 2 hemorrhage on the magnitude. Who did not respond to whatever we did uh, to her in the stage 1 of obstetrical hemorrhage. Her bra speed rates now shows a measure of 1200 cc blood loss and I have with uh, me the entire team who is there to resuscitate her. Uh, I am continuing bimanual massage here because the uterus is atonic. Doctor, please take the vitals. I pulsated 130 and BP is 85 by 50. Doctor, please inform the anesthetist. Anesthetist, hello. Ma'am, we have an uncontrolled TPS here. Can yes. Immediately? Yes, I am coming. I am attaching my monitors. Mm -hmm. Apart from saturation and uh, BP cuff, we have attached it. Okay, I am attaching my ECG. <coughs> uh, doctor, can you secure one large 16 bore cannula? Secured, ma'am. How many saline has been given? This is RN going. Right. Which one? Fifth yes. one. Okay. I need to assess my blood loss also, ma'am. How much blood loss in this brass sheet? Uh, it is 1500 now, and oh. this is the only blood loss which we have. Okay. Any sponges you have thrown up, ma'am? No, no, no. Are the drape sheets all clear? Yeah. Very okay. Much okay. Okay. Now the pulse rate is around 130 and BP is around 80. Can you kindly cross check the blood? Yes, ma'am. Doing. I'm continuing my massage here. The uterus becomes flabby intermittently. Okay. I am simultaneously warming the patient by attaching the fluid warmer and body warmer and trying to keep the patient warm and attaching the temperature probe also simultaneously and watching for the urine output. It is around 40 for the past half an hour. Mrs. M, you have got a little more bleeding than the normal. We are attaching a blood transfusion for you. Have you ever been transfused previously? No. If you got any symptoms like fever, back ache, you have to inform me immediately. Sister, please keep the PPS set ready. The uterus is flabby. Doctor, kindly can you get this ABG done for me? Yes, ma'am. The uterus is intermittently flabby. I think I need to go in for you trying to tap on that. Sister, please open the buckley balloon. Doctor, I would require some assistance here. Mrs. Yam, are you fine? Thank you. Vitals, doctor? Our pulse rate is 120 and BP is 80 by 50. Mrs. A, are you okay? Ma'am, she is obeying fine. She is obeying our commands also. Our uh, pulse rate is also getting settled down to around 90, 100. And BP is also improved around 120, 70, ma'am. And her APG report is also fine. But yes. I have ongoing blood loss here, doctor. I think I need to insert the buckley balloon here. Okay. Uh, I need some help here. I am now inserting the buckley balloon for tamponade. Doctor, can you please inflate the balloon here? Yes, ma'am. 50 ml of saline infused. Please keep a count on how much you are inserting. I'm 300 ml of saline infused loading. Okay, so we have 300 uh, ml of saline gone in the balloon and I now think the bleeding is under control. Please insert 50 more. Yes, ma'am. Done. Alright, the bleeding appears to be stopped now. Mrs. Air, are you okay? 
she fine? Yes, ma'am, she is fine. Okay. By uh, chance? Her pulse rate is 110 and BP is 90 by 50. All right. So, Mrs. N is now okay. We have controlled the postpartum. Loss is more than 15 ml. Blood has already been transfused, and now we have suspicion of DIC. And whenever DIC sets in, things are going to become worse. We are in deep trouble, as you can all see. And now we need to resort to help to manage the DIC or prevent the DIC at whatever point we are. We need to probably use the massive transfusion protocol. And we need to maintain the hematocrit more than 24%, platelets more than 50,000, fibrogen more than 100, hemoglobin more than 8. This is a minimum. It should be higher than that. Because if you have a low hematocrit, the hemostasis will anyway become impaired because of low platelet adhesion, because of high blood velocity. So that is another point which will, which uh, the physiological basis of these uh, parameters that have been set. And here we need the help of transfusion medicine and specialists. There will be slight digression. We'll come back to our patient about of management, but we need to have certain information, and there are some points highlighted. And I invite Dr. Sharma to come and tell me uh, how much blood, and plus uh, we need a lot of supplies of blood also now at this point of time. Uh, Dr. Sharma is from the Department of Transfusion Medicine. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think uh, it's an equally uh, challenging task as for our clinical colleagues for transfusion medicine also. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, arranging blood and uh, keeping the inventory because sometimes uh, they really drain off our inventory. And blood banking and PPH has a very close relation. I think, uh, as you might be knowing, that it was James Blundell who started uh, transfusion from human to human, seeing his patients uh, dying because of PPH. So, it, it, was, it was the late 19th century. So, uh, now, uh, in, as far as we are concerned, I mean, if a patient is well supervised antenatally and her hemogram and everything is fine, so we can always uh, keep cross match units for her and uh, manage the situation as and when required. But like in emergency obstetric hemorrhage, when they report, it becomes very difficult. So it, this is just to apprise you of that how the things go in our setup. Like we receive a requisition, perform an ABO and RH typing, then assess our inventory whether that, is, uh, that particular group is available or not because sometimes a patient is of negative uh, groups or a rare type then it, uh, it becomes a nightmare I mean it becomes again difficult then we perform an immediate spin cross match perform documentation so as far as urgent or immediate I mean uh, in emergency situations it might take 30 to 40 minutes but we might not have this much of time in emergency and as far as ARG cross match is concerned indirect Coombs test what we call it it might take another uh, two and a half to three hours. And if a patient is having underlying antibodies, if it is incompatible, then the immunohematological workup again can take uh, 24 to 48 hours. But I think this done does not work in emergency situations. So depending upon the clinical urgency of the situation, immediately, I mean, we don't have any time for any grouping or any cross-matching, then we just issue group ORH negative back cells. But if we have some time at least to perform the grouping, then we issue group specific blood, but this is uncrossmatched. But if we still have some time, say around half an hour to 40 minutes, then we do an immediate spin crossmatch. But this not this does not does not detect irregular antibodies, which has to be done in otherwise anti well uh, supervised antenatal uh, booked cases, because it has been seen that pregnant women are more prone for aluminization, because this is a 30 year data from Minitoba University of Win Winnipeg that these women, as we know that besides anti producing anti-D, there are a lot of clinically significant antibodies, which might cause problem because these have been uh, relevant for causing jaundice. So any uh, antibody produced by the mother which can cause jaundice, that antibody can give rise to a hemolytic transfusion reaction if this lady receives a blood which is positive uh, for those antigens. So it is recommended that routine prenatal workup for unexpected dead cell antibodies, even in RH D positive women, should be done and if required, uh, throughout the pregnancy and is required if antibodies are present and compatible blood can be thus provided when an irregular antibody is detected in advance at the earliest. So this is just brief equipments what we use at our end to hasten up the process and uh, this is just, uh, this is what a uh, red cell antigen uh, panel antigram looks like like we have rh antigens and its sub antigens kel duffy kit lewis and other uh, anti the antigens of importance of clinical significance
So this is how the reaction, this is our, I mean, uh, reaction looks like. If it is incompatible, it gives a 4 plus and a compatible uh, will reveal as a cell of button down in the chamber. So as Dr. Kajal have rightly said, the traditional resuscitative approach is to achieve acute normolemia with the help of uh, large crystalloids, uh, maintain tissue oxygenation with the help of packed red cells, and treat dilutional coagulopathy, I mean if it ensues, and with the help of cryoprecipitate and FFP, and platelets, yes of course, when there is dilutional thrombocytopenia. So this was, uh, I mean, uh, but, uh, as far as component therapy is concerned, uh, they say that initially if the blood loss is less than 20% as uh, you have already seen how to measure it, so people were of varying opinion, you see, that uh, either the ratio of FFP or packed red cell it could be 4 is to 1 to 2 is to 1, but when it goes between 20 to 50, it certainly should be between 2 is to 1 or 1 and when it is more than 50%, it should be uh, 1 is to 1. But now, uh, and the hemoglobin at all stages, uh, ideally, I mean, if it is less than 6, transfusion is imminently required. And uh, if it is between 6 to 10, then the clinical symptom, uh, symptoms will uh, certainly uh, guide. And if patient is having cardiopulmonary problems, then uh, yes, I think the, the trigger close to 10 must be uh, adhered to. And uh, with the help of, uh, this is uh, uh, the packed red cells, a, a brief word, like these are routinely available in various blood banks. They are suspended in plasma. So in those situations, dilutional thrombocytopenia will appear before the prothrombin diamond APTT uh, gets prolonged. However, in situations when you have sagam or red cells in additive solutions, the coagulation profile prolongs before the actual thrombocytopenia appears. So when to transfuse this acid? fresh frozen plasma and plate should concentrate. I think it is based on the laboratory evidence like prothrombin time and uh, APTT if it is more than 1.5 times the normal, fibrinogen content is less than 100 milligram per deciliter, platelet count below uh, 50,000. But yes, uh, we have to, uh, a patient who is having CNS symptoms or who might have some seizures, you need to give platelets at a higher level. So, and uh, uh, generally, uh, dose which is uh, followed is around 10 to 15 ml of FFP per kg body weight and this transfusion increases about 8 to 10 percent of coagulation factors because FFP contain all the coagulation factors. Likewise, cryoprecipitate again increases, uh, this is primarily for fibrinogen, it increases by 10 milligram per deciliter uh, depending upon the dose. And the platelet concentrates, we have random donor as well as the apheresis. This is for random donor platelet, if this uh, one unit of platelet concentrate uh, raises a count by 5 to 10,000 per microliter. So fresh frozen plasma, this has a volume of around 200 ml and uh, it contains all the clotting factors. Fibrinogen level varies from 2 to 400 ml and to raise a fibrinogen level from 100 ml to 200 milligram to 200 milligram per deciliter in a 60 kg female, it's around 6 units of FFP would be required as per the dose. But higher doses may be required in critically ill patients. And a cryoprecipitate, it has a lower volume. The difference is just because, I mean, uh, although FFP contains all the coagulation uh, factors, FFP cryo contains mainly uh, factor 8, fibrinogen, and factor 13, and von Willebrand factor. Whereas it contains all, but uh, cryo uh, is used when there is a concern of volume overload basically. As you see, with 10 units of cryo, we will be raising the same amount of fibrinogen, but you will be just infusing 200 ml of uh, fluid. Whereas with FFP, with 6 units, you will be infusing 1200 ml of fluid. So this is very important when the fluid overload is a serious concern. So as far as apheresis uh, products are concerned, we have both the products like apheresis platelets and random donor platelets. A random donor platelets, they raise, as I told you, 5 to 10,000, uh, one, uh, I mean, uh, one unit transfusion, whereas they raise around 25 to 30,000, and they, they are very rich, I mean, they are 5 to 6 times efficacious as compared to random donor platelets, but they are slightly uh, costly. So just to summarize here that one unit of packed red cell would going to increase the hematocrit by 3% or hemoglobin by 1%. Random donor platelet uh, would increase the platelet count by 5 to 10,000 per microliter. Fresh frozen plasma uh, would one unit 250 ml would go into 10 to 15 milligram per deciliter and a cryoprecipitate would increase uh, fibrinogen by uh, 10 to 15%. So the monitoring is very important. 
initial monitoring before you start, uh, since uh, such patients are closely monitored, so initial minimum, uh, this is the minimum laboratory workup after 4 hours and then after 10 units. So this is just to switching over, I mean this, this uh, to understand this would be a better communication between transfusion services and obstetrician, uh, clinical services is that suppose a patient is O type and you have, uh, uh, I mean this is just when the inventory is finished. So O individuals as far as red cells are concerned, they are universal donors, but they can accept red cells from O only, they cannot accept red cells from any other individuals. Whereas AB, if the patient is AB, she can receive uh, blood from O, A, B and AB if they are, if you are giving her packed cells. But on the contrary, AB individual as far as plasma is concerned, they are universal donors because AB is a neutral plasma. So this plasma can be given to any of the groups like AB can be given to B, A or AB, O. So as far as O individuals are concerned, they are for red cells, they are universal donors, but they can receive red cells from only from O individuals. Whereas they can receive plasma from any of the groups, plasma products. So, those, so they, for plasma they are universal recipient and for red cells they are universal donors. Whereas AB individuals for red cells they are universal recipient but for plasma they are universal uh, donors. So this is an uh, important thing. Uh, uh, as far as cryo precipitate or smaller platelet concentrates are concerned they can be given across the ABO barriers because of smaller volumes. RH negative in case of emergency, we need to, uh, we can give with the consent of the clinical colleague, RH uh, positive uh, uh, cells can be given, but if you, uh, are, you are having red cells of negative type but you don't have a platelet concentrate, then you There is also a way to diagnose. So points to remember what irregular antibodies screen should be done in all high risk patients who are at risk for PPH during antenatal period. It's also called extended cross match. So the time, if they need blood, it can be available quickly. Uh, use of component therapy, use of lab values, tag or bedside. And recombinant factor 7A role comes when you have given more than 10 to 12 units of packed RBC and still bleeding is not getting controlled. And that is where it's a very expensive but the therapy costs for patient 1.5 lakh rupees. Recombinant factor 7A. So now we are still back to stage 3 hemorrhage. The bleeding is continuing, vitals are unstable. The tamponade procedure has not worked and we need to call in a second anesthetist. A central line, an arterial line, vasopressors, intubation, massive hemorrhage fire and repeat the investigations which we were doing onward. Here the time is she will probably be moved to the OR for a surgical correction to know why what is happening or we have an alternate measure, arterial embolization which is available with us. Now, who are the patients who have to go to OT for a definite surgery or who can be managed with embolization is a very difficult question to answer. And so often when we are in this situation, we ask each other, we take the opinion of colleagues, senior colleagues who guide us as to what should be done. But the basic rule is that if she is hemodynamically relatively stable and she is not pouring, we can attempt an embolization. But if she is in a bad situation, hemodynamically unstable or bleeding heavily, then she's not a candidate who will be able to withstand <coughs> embolization or benefit by it. So usually it is done prior to laparotomy, but at times even after a laparotomy, after everything is done, after a hysterectomy, also embolization can be attempted.